Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. It was like really a big street fight to try to live. That I had to start like recognizing those thoughts as a way that if, if I believed I was bad, then I could never come into a room and be hurt. I was ensuring I was controlling my own rejection. So through all the practices that I've had at yin yoga, the trauma program, the recognition that those crazy thoughts are actually trying to protect me, and then coming back in, creating the space in the body through the breath, through the other things I do, there's a way to renegotiate with the nervous system and over time rewire. And so now when the crazy thoughts come, right, on a good day, I can be like, oh, I'm just gonna breathe because it's my system telling me something that's very real, but not actually true. Here's a space where I can renegotiate what that discomfort is, where it comes from, what I can do to sort of capacity build when I'm uncomfortable off the mat. It's allowed me to like find the other spectrum of joy and happiness and stuff like that, which was never, I never thought possible. Hey, it's Fei Wu, and I'm back for part two of our two-part series with our new guest, Emily Peterson. If this is the first time for you to listen to Face World, welcome. I hope you stay for a while and please consider subscribing to the show. Face World is ad-free and completely self-funded by me and Face World LLC, a marketing service for people and businesses. If you have not listened to part one with Emily Peterson, I highly recommend that you go back one episode. Uh, there were a lot of really interesting stories and personal experiences shared by Emily. She is a certified 500-hour yoga instructor, Usui Reiki master, and licensed Timbo facilitator and trainer. This series is hosted by me and my executive producer, Adam Leffert. And uh, if you enjoy this format or you're able to learn a, a few things, please let us know. We are on social media everywhere by Phase World, and we look forward to hearing from you. After running Phase World for nearly three years, I have probably embarrassed myself a number of times on the show but nothing compared to what you're about to hear. As an energetic, creative, and sometimes fearless learner, I have often created my own English phrases. My English teacher in China did not appreciate the help. When I came to the U.S., it was one of the first things I had to abandon. This episode contains one of those malaprops, so listen carefully. You may or may not learn something. Without further ado, please welcome Emily Peterson back for part two of our conversation. I think not until I was in my 20s, maybe mid 20s. Well, now I just remember that's when my dad was diagnosed with cancer and this very slow, painful death of two years, losing him at 26. And first, uh, ever in my lifetime to pursue um, psychotherapy and I thought it was such a joke. I, five sessions, I'll be done. And I ended up staying there for a year and spending very little time talking about my dad and turning the topic into talking about my mom, which is a huge realization altogether. Um, but there are things that I remember this woman was coaching me, was asking myself, how am I feeling right now? You know, how does it feel in my heart? on my body, you know, do I feel cold or hot or do I, I was like, well, these are such stupid questions. I thought to myself, like, why, 
such basic questions, like just even the structure of the sentences, like a three-year-old would know. And I realized I never actually asked myself those questions. So these days when I get into a situation, as I'm driving to the pool at three in the afternoon to think, my life is really good right now. I'm feeling happiness. As in, when I get into an argument, I ask myself, wait a minute, I'm feeling tense, uncomfortable, maybe not so much of worthlessness. Um, but I said, do I give that person the power to make me feel that way? Is that person even thinking about me that way? Is he even doing this intentionally? Maybe he's having a terrible time. So that was so helpful for me to realize that and to be able to, am I over that right away? Probably not. But I'm able to set aside, go for a walk or something, and to revisit that. Whereas I see my parents over time without a lot of knowledge, whether reading a book or actually seeing someone practicing yoga, um, they tend to escalate very quickly, as in, we're in this moment, let's resolve it. I've never seen anybody step away from a fight and to come back to it more peacefully. So I just kind of echoing, I feel like you're sharing your stories with so many people. I wonder, how does it make you feel to share your stories, especially at the beginning versus now? You seem very comfortable. Um, thanks. Sometimes looks can be deceiving. <laughs> There's like, There's still stuff going on in here. Um, and now I've sort of worked into the capacity of being able to be present while this is going on, you know, inside the storm. But, you know, I think as I have tried to figure out what my purpose is here, you know, and people have come into my life concurrently and given me the practices or, you know, open the space for the practices. I have to just keep renegotiating with my own system. I don't know how to say it any other way. And it's gotten easier because what happens in these practices is that you actually rewire, mm -hmm. right? So going from disassociating to yoga to just noticing my heart beating faster and being able to take a breath, or like you said, mm -hmm. which was so important to just pause and maybe go for a walk and be like, okay, I'm actually feeling what's happening in my body right now. Mm -hmm. You just talked about how you're noticing the thoughts that are in conjunction with those feelings. I'm gonna pause, mm -hmm. kind of remove myself from this, whatever's happening, mm -hmm. take some space mm -hmm. and put it inside of a practice, whatever that practice may be for you. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of open up a space going back from a different nervous system, Yeah. right? And the thing that you said this also is so incredibly important was recognizing when you're happy, right? I mean, that in and of itself is a huge, a huge thing. I mean, you know, it's my understanding with panic attacks and things like that, right? It's not the actual thing that promotes the, you know, sort of pushes forward the panic attack. It's the fear of the sensations and the elevation of the panic attack that then feeds like the system mm -hmm. and then the panic attack ensues, right? And so kind of understanding the sensation in the body and then also for me, huge, what you said has been huge of like, oh wait, I have an absence of fear right now. I'm actually happy. What does that feel like in my body? And recognizing those moments and then renegotiating from there. Um, yeah, I want to talk about Timbal, actually. I know it's such a huge part of your career and your life. The two mm -hmm. are certainly intertwined. And uh, tell us a bit about Timbo. I, I only learned about it because of you. And at the same time, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like what an incredible resource. Only more people discovered it earlier now. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, well, it's not that old. First of all, it's not, the program in and of itself has not been in existence for that long. Mm -hmm. And yes, <laughs> I wish everyone had access to it, and that's certainly a hope. But TIMBO is, is, stands for Trauma-Informed Mind-Body Program, and it's a mindfulness-based trauma recovery program. And again, I'm going to say that trauma applies to every single person on the planet, so you don't have to have the big T trauma uh, to come into the program. But it's a, a program that works with what I'm talking about, this awareness that we all have a primitive system that's still running the show to some degree to create space around the sensations that we feel in the body that normally you said adam of like we'd either try to get rid of or we'd kind of go into the thoughts around them and how we can drive a wedge between the sensations in the body and the actions and the thoughts and the behaviors and we do that through a curriculum-based program. It's very much around present moment awareness of body sensations. And we do that thing by like reading a quote. And you'd be surprised at how many sensations people can have, including myself, at just reading a quote. And then we do a lot of breathing, a lot of, again, sort of what's happening in my body right now. 
choosing a tool to create that space so that we can begin to start having a new reference point. Oh, I felt like, and it becomes then an addiction program, an eating disorder program, a parenting program, a relationship program, right? Like what happens when I'm with my partner and I wanna just unleash, can I just pause for one moment and turn back into my body and be like, okay, like I feel these sensations, can I breathe? driving that wedge in between what's happening in here and what's going to about to come out of my mouth that could just really disrupt the next 24, 48 hours for us. Mm -hmm. So we practice creating space, awareness, acceptance, and space are the principles of the program. And then we do trauma-sensitive yoga and guided meditation in each uh, session. And we work off, again, sort of the, the emotional anatomy pyramid of fear being the, the foundation for all other proceeding uh, emotional anatomy disruption stages of guilt, shame, how these things, how fear turns or kind of adds on to guilt and to shame as we sort of grow up, needing that connection to stay alive, to guilt. I'm making a mistake, right? I'm crying. My mom's angry. Oh, I can adapt. I can change my behavior so that, that we stay connected to, I can actually, I have the capacity to feel sad, to feel uncomfortable, to choose a tool to breathe, to create a new space, and then to do something different, which might be take a walk, mm -hmm. or read a book, or practice yoga, or sing, or whatever it is, or re-engage with my partner in an empathetic way, mm -hmm. versus like in a blame, or like mm -hmm. a resenting sort of way. Yeah. When you think I'm bad, I think you're worse. You're the worst, you know? <laughs> it takes two, it's, it's very, um, I think really it's educating people on a the cultural, on so many levels, but, I am intrigued because you, right before we started um, recording, you had mentioned that you listened to a little bit of uh, B.C. Lopococo's episode where she also shared with me, for her, you know, she's um, from um, heritage, also from Africa. But when she went back to Africa and tried to speak in front of women who have real life struggles, or she was born and raised in Spain, now she lives in New York, some women said, wait a minute, how are you qualified to talk to us? You don't know our struggles. And she was able to relate to them in a, in a very strategic and a very authentic way. I wonder what was it like for you being Caucasian to be in Africa and trying to relate to these women? How did you do that? Well, first I freaked out. <laughs> Step one, step one, right, step one <laughs> freak out and do a lot of breathing. Cause again, I went over there with like, how, how are they gonna relate to this girl? You know, this, what my story and that I remember, I will never forget it, and it's such a visceral thing. The, when we got to the training, the first morning we showed up and all of the women that we were working with, together with, came out of the dining hall and they were singing and they were dancing and they just formed a circle around us and we tried to chime in and you know get involved and it was like goosebumps, right? Because it was just like, first of all, it just cut out everything. So it was such an incredible gift. It was such an incredible gift that they just were like, we're just gonna envelop you guys and take you in. And I don't know what they were experiencing before that moment either, but it was such a show of like openness and generosity and it was, it was beautiful. And then it didn't happen right away, right, where I just showed up and, and could relate. I mean, we create a space to offer, and one of the things that's different about Timbo is that we share, as facilitators or trainers, we share personal insights. And they're very strategic, and they're, you know, we do it in a very specific way. But it's a program based in mutuality and empathy. So I'm not sitting there ever saying that I'm fixed or I have the answer for you. There will be a moment in time where I can relate my own personal experience of a moment, which I've had, where I wasn't sure that I was going to live. And to just open up my own space of being vulnerable, which in those moments there looked like tears, right? So that they could see that I wasn't any different on that level. And then also opening up a space for them to walk into that, that like to bring their own rejoicing and to teach us about like living in the present moment. I mean, that's my job and that's what I do is to try to help people do that. But it, it kind of cuts through. And yes, at the beginning, I think everyone was looking at each other like, 
how are we going to do this? Because I've never actually been sat next to a white woman before mm -hmm. and you're coming all this way to fix me. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> however, once they started to see that we were not actually very different, mm -hmm. then we, then that was like the empathetic mutual space from which we could then move. So I, I want to, I have something to say to that. I noticed some transitions in me. I think since my dad's passing, that was a awakening moment. But how long did that last, right? Oh, maybe the TPS report isn't all that important. Well, I had that feeling for a few months, and all of a sudden, I, my anxiety kind of went back to the old place. But in recent years, I'm 34, um, but I noticed I recognize myself no longer as the person with the ping pong ball uh, being bounced around. When I see myself, or you're dreaming, just imagining myself, I become a very abstract term. I no longer imagine myself as oh, what, how, did, how does my hair look like? Well, what, what was that shirt I was wearing, right? Was that in pain? But I felt like myself as an abstract concept. I was just like almost like in a way that me no longer exists, you know? I am here for the moment. I mean, literally, if we're lucky, 100 years is the, the, the space that we have, the time that we have on the planet. And the, the happiest moment when I feel like the proudest the moment I feel like I'm myself is when I'm able to, like you said, influence other people, instill hope. You know, like Johnny Bang Riley said, hope is a drug that's hope is the drug that's homegrown for free, right? And it's so powerful to hear that. But and all I know is that every single person on this planet has the same the same mechanisms in play and how they had to adapt to stay safe. So the Mopi Bar dude still wants to be connected, right. right? But can't get out of his own way, doesn't have the space, doesn't know how. Um, you know, my partner says to me sometimes to me, like, you do all this work for people of holding space, of holding space, of holding space. I mean, that is my job if I were to put something on my card. So I'm like a professional space holder. Mm -hmm. Because a, like, I get it. Like, I can now look at people and be like, oh, their adaptations are running. That's not their authentic self. So I'm not going to take what they're saying personally because they're not running from the present moment. And even if they are, and even if they do literally hate my class and never want to come back, I know in my own system that I'm actually not going to die if I'm rejected. Right. So that's done the work on my part to also, like, hold the space for them. So that's a phrase that that's a phrase that kind of hit me funny the first time, and then I heard it a bunch of times, and I think I sort of figured out uh, to holding space. Uh -huh. So for our non yogis in the audience, yeah, and, and just because we're here being so esoteric and deep and high level, just in a simple way, like what is that? For somebody's like, what the heck does that even mean? So holding space is just taking a pause and just sort of. It's hard to talk about, right? More and what's more than I more about what I doing it than talking about it, right? It's in, if I'm holding space for myself, right? I'm sitting here, noticing the sensations in my body and doing nothing. I'm just pausing. And in that pause, I can feel my heart beating. I can feel I'm getting like ramped up. I can hear the voice going, wait, they told you to talk at a certain level and to <laughs> their voices, right? That's the nervous system running. But I can pause, I can put my hands on my chest and there's the space. In that space, I can breathe. And then I can come back here and not let all that other stuff dictate how this is gonna go. But again, we're so far away from like how we feel in our bodies. We're so up here, we're so distracted, we're so doing all this out of here. Mm -hmm. That for me, the, the basic space holding is what we have to do to ourselves. Again, just pausing, feeling into the body. You're like, what am I feeling right now? I'm thinking visualizing it for me too. Like I'm just this sponge, not a pretty one or a fancy <laughs> one from somewhere. I'm just a regular sponge. Like I can be, you know, like dried up, puffy and happy, but I can absorb a lot of water and be heavy and be, but that I can hold it where I can let out. It's an option. I just feel like, you know, one of those silly sumo wrestling team building thing where you get into this huge sumo suit and you just bounce around. Mm -hmm. Like you're, nobody ever gotten hurt before. That's right, kind of right, that, right. 
the visualization I have when I have space mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not like I'm so armored up with these heavy metals around me, like not even an inch away from my skin, but I'm standing in, I think of space, I'm standing in front of the forest. It doesn't have, it could be the garden right behind you. Right. And then I'm sitting in this room. I have space run around and I don't feel suffocated. Yeah. Um, I have time and space to make that decision, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I remember personally, I've been very lucky to um, not have really either witnessed so much of discrimination, racism, or perhaps there are times that maybe I have overlooked them, to be honest. <laughs> I thought maybe they were, you know, not related to me. But I remember when I was 19, I got out of my building, I was in college, and the, and the guy, you know, kind of sloppy looking, riding a bicycle and say, you know, F you, you Chinese, you know, literally hearing that word. I've never met this person, and he was screaming, and actually scared me because it was a kind of a big man, and I thought I was being attacked, and he, he was just on his way. He wasn't even going to get off and beat me up, and I just very uh, nervous for that moment. I heard from my close friends, women who have been attacked, you know, sexually multiple times, and I, you know, sometime in the middle of dinner, and they're able to talk about it now, and I just remember just have to hold myself from crying out loud and you know how do women overcome sexual abuse whether they're including the their time they don't even know that, that was happening they weren't even aware of what was happening to later on they they have to acknowledge how do you recover reconcile and move on with your life because it's feels like always part of you yeah i mean that's a really good question and um you know i can only speak from personal experience in my own recovery from it. And it takes, it, it takes being able to feel excruciating sensations in the body. And then to, like you, you said before, to sort of let that energy move. I had um, something a couple of months ago, and I think I was working for a long time. It's sort of, you know, because a couple of things, one, the body really actually only gives you what you what it can handle. Its number one job is to stay alive. So even though it feels like something is going to perhaps kill us or be too much for us, the body only gives us what, what we can handle. So on some level it knows if we were to kind of like step up to the plate that we could do it, right? So now I know that things are coming forward from my past to be healed in a way where, you know, a lot of my sexual abuse stuff I disassociated through. So I'm like, wow, well, what's my process here? Am I gonna have to, how much am I gonna have to relive and all that? Mm -hmm. So this situation came up that it didn't dawn on me until like I was going to go do this thing in that morning and I went into like a full fledged, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't, you know, I was like, what the hell is happening? And then I was like, oh, right, this situation very much resembles to my body like a past situation. So what I had to do in the moment, again, was to stop. I'm feeling these excruciating sensations and th similar, my guess is, to the sensations I experienced, even though I was disassociating had I been present, in the actual attack, and then have to sit in that and breathe and do different things like reach out to people and whatever who, who could, could, who knows, you know, to rely on my partner, but it's, it has to be, it has to be being able little bit by little bit by little bit, like sticking the toe, backtracking, sticking the toe in safe situations to sit in the discomfort. And that's how personally I recover. I, mean, I have a partner, I have a sexual abuse history of being able to, over a 10 year period of time, to be like getting to the place of being able to say, no, I don't feel like this right now. Um, and being able to use my voice again, even though that goes against a lot of stuff that's happening in my body and being able to breathe and being able to keep telling me, and this sort of goes back to something that you said earlier that I would just like to say one thing about, but to be able to tell myself now that this is not actually happening, right? I disassociated through a lot of it, so it doesn't serve me necessarily in that moment to call someone up and say, this is what happened, or this is what I remember happening, and da, da da because in the moment, my body thought it was happening again. So how can I reinforce to the body that it's not actually happening? But to do that, I have to let that energy or whatever, I have to let the body move it. And so I need to, to stay with it 
and be able to breathe. And that is excruciating. And I didn't want to do that for a long time. So I did all these things to keep myself from feeling. Mm -hmm. And so what the yogic practices do, right? Whether it's yogic or mindfulness, secular or otherwise, praying, whatever it is, but, but breathing and movement. So even taking a breath in, lifting your arms up, however you want to do it, up to the sky, breathing out, drawing your hands down. That is starting over time to repair the brain in trauma, right? The neurons, the synapses, all of that stuff kind of goes offline, right? So that our amygdala, our primitive system starts to run the show. Yeah, I like that. Instead of uh, going right to the resolution mode, right? You know, I notice with women, sometimes they just, they know that you just need someone to listen. You don't, especially when, you know, some of my friends are going through trauma with, you know, losing their husbands still at a young age, successful young kids, and then, you know, or have young kids and going through breast cancer and it somehow just hit home like who who are why who are we? Why are we here? Like you and said. uh, you know, what can we do for each other? Yeah. Can we just bring food over and just be there? Yeah. And talk about whatever they want to talk about. And um, so it's it's so powerful to be in that I don't even know if there's a word I mean, and that's what Tempo does, because, you know, I mean, and how we run the program, um, again, some of our, our, my job as a facilitator of that program is to create space, Mm -hmm. to create mutuality Mm -hmm. and empathy, um, and to reinforce this biology and stuff, and and some different things, but, you know, we don't, we ask at the very beginning, you know, it's trauma sensitive, so we, we are make sure when, you know, three of the universal triggers of stress or lack of information, lack of control, and uncertainties. And that's the world we live in, right? So how do we learn new me- mechanisms to cope with those things that are part of our life? But we ask that people don't even pass each other, each other tissues. Mm-hmm. If somebody needs a tissue, we set up a lot of tissue boxes. If somebody needs a tissue, they can either ask for it or they can reach for it themselves. Because how many people grew up in environments either where like, don't cry or I give you something to cry about. Or when I'm <laughs> passing you the tissue, if I see that you're in tears, mm-hmm. when I'm passing you the tissues, even if I have the best intentions, there's something going on in me, typically, not all, all the time, but there's something that's, that I'm uncomfortable with, with what's happening in here, mm-hmm. that I need this to go away. Mm-hmm. So how do we create a space where women or people can come in, cry as much as they need to. Sometimes we'll keep group going. It doesn't mean that you know the, the, the thing stops, but we believe fundamentally that you have everything inside of you you need to be healthy. You are healthy. It just we're gonna give you this space, this structure, practices. You know, somebody had to do it for me for a long time, pause me and be like, what are you feeling? Let's take a breath. Not like, I'm going to fix you. Here's the answer to your problem. Here's your advice. But here's a space that you can come in and you will be unconditionally loved. And it's super hard for people because, like, for me, I push back. I'm like, bullshit. Like, I'm going to do this and this and this thing because I don't believe you. And it took me a long time to get it. And that's what we do in that program. And people will push and push. And, you know, if you stay in it, some people don't then, you know, it's the group holding the space of like, you can come in, you can be angry, you can cry, you can be quiet, you can never say a word, and you are still welcome in this space. And there might even be someone, and most likely there will be, when you share something of your story that's gonna be like, me too. I think there's, there's also the distrust of the kind of bunch of smiley people, just to say it out loud, so being, you know, born in mid 60s, growing up in the 70s, of just to say it, just like the sort of cultiness right. that, uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, we knew this guy and he was happy all the time. And I asked somebody, uh, what, what's his deal? What's Bruce's deal? And they're like, uh, he's probably nuts. And then I probably realized 30 years later, maybe Bruce was right all along. Maybe he knew something that we didn't. And maybe just historically what happened with all those, with, you know, various cults and big bunch of smiley people being smiley and offering people, I mean, without calling out specific, you know, religious or cultural groups, offering people that unconditional positive regard who maybe don't have the money and time for an Upper East Side or an Upper West Side shrink and pills and this and that, you know, brings them in. So from a over-intellectual, over-industrialized, like Faye was saying, customer service representative, kind of like, oh, this person's cranky, let's get them their new toaster and then we'll, you know, kind of send them on their way. So I think that's another thing that can keep people who think of themselves as intelligent or educated or even maybe enlightened from accepting that love. 
because a group of people, whether it's yoga teachers or some social group or even a chorus or something, no, that's it's almost too good to be true. Like, like I said, like deserving the love, like, oh, can it just be that easy? Well, you have to be, you have to make yourself vulnerable to some extent to accept and receive love. It's so incredible to have those tools to access to. When I remember uh, if you grow up in a traditional family or from my parents' generation, they pick up a book, whether it's something, you know, whether it's Temple or it's Tony Robbins, they say, oh, that's trivial. I already know that, but do you? You know, should I quiz you? You know, there was a period of time where my mom and I didn't get along, but now we're great. During that period, I never saw, I did not see the light at the end of the tunnel. I never thought this relationship uh, now we have could possibly exist. I remember going to see a, a shrink, well, that, that time period when my, after my dad passed away, and I said, uh, I have a, you know, I said, I live in an apartment, one bedroom apartment, my mom's staying with me, space is limited, and she not only yells at me, she kind of follows me around, and she's like, why don't you get out? I said, well, you have no idea what it's, what it's like to be an Asian child. I cannot get out of the house. My mom threatened me and jumped off the building. I mean, literally, she's like, oh, okay. She's like, that's interesting. How about you open the window a little bit? And what if you just go to the refrigerator and just open up the refrigerator door? And I, when she told me that, I was like, ah, okay. Uh-huh. And then so literally, I remember just holding that door open just, and just let that sensation, that coldness, they hit me like as I was sweating. I was like, my goodness, who doesn't have a refrigerator at home? Right. But nobody knows how to use that right. at that moment. It sounds as silly, as childish, as vulnerable as it is. I'm like, by the time I got out of the she's like, you hungry? I'll cook you dinner today. Like, you know? I'm sorry, did I break your concentration? Games <laughs> are But what you did was create space. Yeah. Like there are so many examples, either creating like actual physical space by opening up a window and having, you know, either the air or the perception that the room is bigger or whatever, yeah, like having yeah. an exit strategy yeah. or exit. like, you know, opening the refrigerator, you're still sort of making an active choice to pause yeah. and kind of go inside and like yeah. do something there to create a yeah. wedge, as Viktor Frankl would say, between the stimulus and the response. Yeah, yeah, it's really powerful. That's why I, uh, Chinese people have, they hold on to the thing of our language is so sophisticated, so beautiful, and it's true, but it's just the insight. I try to tell a lot of my friends in a nice way that English as a language is incredibly rich and sophisticated. You know, it's as simple as the phrase, it takes two to tangle. There's no such phrase, and it's just a very different form. I'm like, and I try to imagine it. I just imagine two ropes, you know, getting tightened up. But I imagine the middle one is completely straight. It doesn't matter how the second one try to wrap around and try to choke it to death. There's no power mm-hmm. from the second piece to the first one. So I, I think of myself like in a very, in a situation if I cannot get out, I cannot walk out. I just imagine myself like kind of floating in the universe and kind of that sh- the shavasana, just like <laughs> kind of just be be straight and just be completely relaxed. And none of these things could possibly attack me. They have no power over me. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Phase Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Phase Royal Podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.